Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Nadarim Daf Ayin Tet. Today's stuff is sponsored by Linda Friedman in honor of her mother's birthday. Happiest of birthdays to mom, Baba Selmi, the great one, Thelma Pultman, for your 96th birthday and happy and healthy year to come from your three daughters, Linda Friedman, Sheila Strilowitz, and Gwen Lerner, your nine grand grandchildren and their spouses, and your 28 grand great grands with one in the oven. Mazel tov. Okay, we are going to get started with Rabbi Hanina. We started with this very strange opinion, which apparently the Gemara seems to think is very strange as well, and is going to raise five questions against Rabbi Hanina. Rabbi Hanina, after all this work of talking about the Yom Sham O, the husband has to nullify the vow on the day he hears it. All of a sudden comes Rabbi Hanina and he says, well, if he has some other motive, like wanting to, I, I even, I, I wanted to talk about this today, but the way I said, I should take him out of I don't remember exactly what word I used, but he's silent in order to teach her a lesson. He wants, talked about yesterday, he really wants to make sure that she understands the gravity of what she did. He just gets rid of it right away. I just want to point out that generally the word lemekat is translated, and you can look in the cover and also they say to annoy. I didn't see that. I don't have the shots in English, but it's translated there to annoy. Now, it sounds a little bit strange when you just say it like that. He's just trying to annoy her. And theoretically, it could be. And it's used in other ways, in other situations, as you do it to annoy somebody. And then it's even more troublesome if he's just doing it to annoy her, like what we allow a husband just to want to annoy his wife. Now, that's why I, I prefer to go with the translate, you know, the explanations that he's doing it to rebuke her, to teach her a lesson. You know, again, it's still a little bit difficult. And, and by what mechanism is he allowed to do this? It's very nice that he has some ulterior motive, but... There needs to be a mechanism in place to allow this to work. Pafara has to happen according to the Torah on that day. What's the difference? What his motivation is? And I think that's what's really bothering the common, you know, the, the rabbis who are going against Rabbi Hanina. How does this work? So theoretically, you could say it works. And there's one way to think about it in conceptual framework is, and we can think about this as we go, and we talked yesterday about there's silence to ratify. There's silence, which is without any... He has no intent whatsoever, which all that is going to be considered kiyum haneder, ratifying. And then there's silence with this intent. He actually wants to nullify. So it could be, we saw before how much the intent in his heart. Now, then he actually had to express something, but that perhaps the intent is enough to say he got started on the hafara on the day of. It's just he didn't actually express it yet and he pushed it off for some reason. But there has to be somehow, according to Rabbi Hanina, I would imagine that the fara sort of starts happening on the day of. Otherwise, there's no way really you could push it off. But it's also possibly a reason why they go really out, out against him. So the structure is going to be like this. We already have one difficulty, the rubber raise. We resolved it by saying, right, there were two kites, kinds of shtika, which we thought meant shtika to ratify versus and shtika to annoy her. But then we realized, no, there's really three there's shtika, right, shtika to ratify, shtika without any intent whatsoever, right, shtika is silence. And those were the two discussed and not our topic. And then therefore, that's really not a difficulty. We're going to see the same threesome uh, trio coming up. And then we're going to have, so that's going to be the second difficulty. The, then the third, fourth, and fifth are going to be left without resolution. And then seems like we're really stuck with Rabbi Hanina that his opinion doesn't really work out very well. And that's going to take us to the end of the parak. So let's start with Mativ Rav Chista. He quotes a Tanitic source. There's a difficulty in, or a strength, you could say, in kiyum, in ratifying. It doesn't exist by nullifying. And there's a difficulty or a stringency in nullification that doesn't apply in ratification. Okay, so this is one of those parallel. We have something that's difficult about this one, but not that one, and something that's difficult about this one and not that one. Chomer bahakem. So now we're going to start with the first. Chomer bahakem. The difficulty in hakem is that hashtika mekayemet ve'ein hashtika mevatelet. Shtika, actually hard to. Why this is a difficulty again? The word kulen chomer used a little bit loosely here. That shtika silence is enough to actually ratify. It can be ratified without actually doing anything. Just silence ratifies it. But shtika does not nullify the vow. Kiyem bilibo kiyem. So this means really, if you ratify it in your heart, it works. Hey, fair bilibo e no mufar. But if you do nullification in your heart, it doesn't work. 
Now it's a very strange line because the the um, the Mishnah is going to the Brita is going to basically even though okay, there's a bit of a problem with the structure of this Brita. The Brita said there's a difficulty by ratifying, which isn't by nullification. There's difficulty by nullification, which isn't by ratifying. You didn't say there's any way they're both equal. So this Brita continues and says this is how they're equal, even though the topic sentence didn't really say that. There's a similarity about them, though, that once you do ratification, you can't actually nullify. And once you nullify, you can't ratify. Okay, that's an obvious uh, thing, but it's anyway somewhere where they're both equal. And then notice it talks about how they're equal. And what doesn't it talk about? It doesn't talk about the Homer Bahafer Mi Bahakem. And you might have thought the, the Bright has just cut off here and they only quote the part that's important to us. But we're going to see the Gemara is going to kick in after we bring in the difficulty. It's going to kick in and say, what happened to the second part? They, they didn't talk about what the Chomer of Hafer Baha came. Okay, so just to, I feel like I'm confusing you a little, but we started off with this Brayta that said, okay, if we forget about why we brought this, let's just focus on the Brayta itself. There's a difficulty in Kiyum that's not by Hafara. We explain what that is, which is that silence is, is translated as consent, and it's not translated as Hafara's nullification. And, and therefore, that means that you can do nullification. You can't do nullification in your heart, but you can do ratification in, in, your, in your mind, in your heart. Then it gave a similarity between them rather than bringing what's the Chumrah about Hafara that isn't by Hakama. So, in any case, what's the point of bringing this? Katane Shashti Kama What does it say? Silence is, rather, is considered consent. Which means my love, and as it sounds like any silence, wouldn't that include, just like we said last time, even if he was silent in order to rebuke her, annoy her, whatever it might be. To which the Gemara says, no. Bisho take him, not like I say, no, it must be silent in order to ratify. To which the Gemara says, So now they go back to those two lines and they say, wait, those are two different things. No, there's shika mekayemet. And then there's kiyem bilibo. Those are two different things. Kiyem bilibo is I was silent with the intent to be mekayem. Shtika mekayem, it must be something else in addition, which is just silence without any intent to ratify, which must mean silence with the intent to rebuke. It's not silence with the intent to ratify. What else must it be? To which they say, Ella bishotek stam. No, there's a third option, like we said last time. So basically, the second line of the Brayta, Kiyem Belibo Kiyem, is talking about silence with the intent to ratify. But Shika Mekayemet is silence without any intent whatsoever. And then Shika Menat Lamekat, if you're in, you have ulterior, you, your silence is that you really wanted to nullify, but you're pushing it off to rebuke her wife, that is not even mentioned here. And then that theoretically could work, and it's not a difficulty. So the first two we resolved in a very similar manner. Before we move on, they say there's just a problem with this Brayta, which is, but what about, it, it, did, it, it forgot the second part of the Brayta that they said they were going to tell us about, which is that Hafer has a Chumrah that the Hakama does not have. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, nishalim al hayakim ve'ein nishalim al hayafel. Rabbi Yochanan comes along and says, um, what is it? It's that you can go to a chacham and get rid of ratification, but you can't get rid of nullification. Once you nullify, it's nullified. You can't go back to a chacham and say, listen, I made a mistake. Had I realized I never would have nullified this vow. But if you ratify the vow, you can actually undo it. We learned this before. And then it's still existing, but then you can nullify it if you want. So that's something that hafara is more stringent because you can't actually get rid of it. So that makes it more strict or more strong, I would say. Okay, so we resolve that, although it still doesn't really answer why the bright didn't say that. But that's a very side issue because it has nothing to do with our topic right now. Matib Rav Kahana, third difficulty. Before we read this third difficulty, we're going to read the verse that they're going to darshan, which is Bamibar, chapter 30, verse 15. Sorry, which is a double language, meaning if the husband is silent, Isha, right? Her husband, from day to day. Remember, we jarred in that already two different ways. Which basically means that day, right? However, you translate that day, 24 hours or that exact day. 
And with that, he ratifies her neder, or et kol asareh asher asareh aleha, okay, or anything she forbade herself to do. Hakemotam, he ratified them. Ki hacharesh abiyom shamo, because he was silent on the day he heard it. You can obviously tell, notice that the end of that pasuk is a repetition of the beginning of the pasuk. So that's what the drush is going to work with. Im hacharesh yacharesh laisha vegomel, bishotek amanat lemekat hakatu betaber. This Brita says explicitly, you can't start saying it means silence without any intent, because here it says, if he's silent, that's considered kiyum haneder, that's considered ratifying it. And what kind of silence does the Brita say? It must be talking about silence in order to rebuke her or to annoy her. To which the Brita continues and says, wait a minute, how do we know that? How do you know that that's what it's talking about? It's a very classic structure of a midrash halacha where it tells you the halacha in the beginning and then it questions it in order to prove to you it's a kind of a, a, a structure that's meant, you know, it was a style, that's what I want to say. It's a style used to say, we're now going to prove how we got there, but they're going to do it by saying, oh, really? How do you know it's that and not something else? And then they're going to prove how they know it is. They always go back to what they said in the beginning. What they said in the beginning stands, but they raise a question against it to kind of show you how they got there. So now they say, right, that's a style of the Midrash Halacha, which is very different than the style of the Mishnah. The Mishnah and the Midrash Halacha are from the same time period, but the Mishnah just usually just states the Halacha and doesn't get into how we know that that's the Halacha. The Midrash Halacha starts with a verse, derives it from the verse, and then often raises a question, how do you know that that's what we derive from the verse and not something else? And then explains themselves. So it's a different style and the Gemara likes to bring it in because it kind of completes the things we see in the Mishnah, for example. In this case, we're bringing it in as difficulty, but in general, it gets brought in a lot. So now he says, the, the Brita says the following. How do you know? It's Shotei Kaman Alamecha. Maybe it's Shotei Kaman Alakayim. Maybe it's he was silent in order to ratify it where his intent was, I'm not going to say anything because I plan for the neder to, to, to stay. So they say the following, well, notice it says in the beginning of the verse, and it says at the end of the verse, which again means he was silent. So there's two different silences being discussed. So when it says at the end of the pasuk, now, I don't know if it really matters which is the beginning, which is the end, but the point is, that it says Akharesh in another place in the verse. So that one you could say is he was silent in order to establish it. So then what's left? Now we know already there is something else left because we've already said there's three, right? We said there's Shotek Stam, where he doesn't have any intent whatsoever. We'll get to that in a minute. But the bright, the Midrash Halacha here says, that must be Shotek and with that, the Gemara says to you, this is clearly a difficulty because it says it explicitly, equals which means what Rabbi Hanina says, that if you're you have 10 days grace period, you can still nullify it. According to this bright, you absolutely cannot. So that's question number three, and it's a problem. However, they raise a question on the bright. They say, but why didn't the Gemara say, why didn't the bright say, sorry, that there's, the lokim, stam. We already know there's these three categories, and we only need two categories in this pasuk. So the obvious two categories would be a man who was silent because he wanted to ratify, and a man who was silent because no intent whatsoever, rather than saying a man who was silent in order to bother his wife. So it's weird that the Midrash Halacha chose the two extremes rather than you know, one extreme and one middle position. That would have been a much better way to do it. To which the answer, cry yeterek If you notice, there's not only two mentions of hacharesh in the pasuk, there's three mentions because in the first mention, it's a double language. Hacharesh yacharish. So in the end, there's three roots of the word, three places where the root chet reshin, silence, appears in that verse. And that's why all three are really included. Okay, they didn't bother telling us about the one stem because that's in the middle. If you're going to have the two extremes, obviously the one in the middle is included as well. And that's how they understand the bright. So question number three is really a question and it's definitely a bright that goes against Rabbi Hanina. Next source, Mativ Rava. I will point out something strange about the structure here. We started with the question of Rava. We went to Rav Chista, we went to Rav Kahana, and now we're back to Rava 
if I were organizing this, I would have thought to put the two Rava questions next to each other. I, I didn't see, I didn't look. I, I mean, I looked at the notes on the DAF. There are places where there's um, Yersa, you know, Dictu Queso Freem goes through different Yersa. You can actually find it online nowadays. Maybe one of the Ravas is really Rava, and then that makes sense. Um, it's definitely not any of the commentaries on the page that, you know, all the usual notes don't change it. But anyway, I was thinking maybe that's it. It's a little bit strange, but that's a very side point. Let's go now to Rava's question. Rava says, Nadra im meferla ad If this is our Mishnah, okay, you took a vow on Shabbos afternoon, just before dark, meferla ad right? All you have is till nightfall to undo that vow. Because, you know, why do we allow this on Shabbos? If you remember, we had a whole thing about it. We allow it on Shabbos, even if it's not for the purposes of Shabbos, because otherwise he'll have no option to undo the vow. To which the Gemara says, am I? Why not? If if we have an exception to the rule, like Rabbi Hanina says, that we can give you up to 10 days if you have some motive like trying to teach your wife a lesson or trying to annoy her for some reason, we allow it, then wouldn't you think that we'd allow it also to push off so that you don't have to do it on Shabbat? So the fact that our mission doesn't allow for that possibility must mean that so take on not lemekat is not a possibility to push it off for 10 days, as he says. Tiyuvta, also a difficulty. Last question. Maybe I'll address already. I see someone ask about why, if they already knocked it out, why do they continue to knock it out? Why do you need more sources? So first of all, okay, I can I can suggest, I don't know the real answer to this, right? We're not with the editors of the Gemara and why they did things the way they did. But one of the things, um, in fact, I was talking to Leah Sarna this week, Rabbi Leah Sarna was teaching, was going to teach the beginner's class in a few weeks, starting on uh, the week after the Seum on January 29th on Sunday. So there'll be three Sundays. Um, the details will come out. So we were talking about one of the issues that we want to discuss in the course is how you get to halacha from the Gemara. And I didn't look up here, okay? It would be a good thing to look up how they pass. And I assume they don't hold like Rabbi Hanina. And as based on the sugya, you would assume the fact that they knock it out over and over is an indicator that they don't hold by him because they've succeeded in knocking out his position. Um, anyway, it would have been a good thing to look up the halacha. I just didn't get a chance. So I invite you all to look it up and see what the halacha is here. But sometimes, and it's often from the structure of a gemara, you can figure out the halacha. Now, whether they're doing it in order to tell you that, I don't know. Another reason, by the way, why they would continually do this is because they're bringing in Tanaitic sources. Now, often people can claim, oh, that's one Tana's opinion, or that's a mistaken brighta. Uh, and you know, the more proofs you have against someone, it's always better because proofs could theoretically get knocked out somehow. And then maybe someone could come up and, and resolve one of the difficulties. And then, but you want to keep showing, but no, 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 we've got more difficulties and more difficulties. So if you get rid of some of them, you're still left with difficulties. So that's a possible answer. I don't have the, the real answer. I don't know what the real answer is, but I, those are some thoughts I had in my head right now. Okay, Mativ Rav Ashi, final question. This is, okay, let me go back to Masechet Shabbat. You might remember Masechet Shabbat in the beginning, we talked about, a lot of Masechet Shabbat is your uh, of a Korban Chatat if you do this. your of a Korban Chatat if you do that. What is a Korban Chatat? It's when you do the Malacha on Shabbat accidentally, unwittingly. What does that mean? So we had some possibilities. One is you didn't know it was Shabbat, right? You knew that it was us to do this on Shabbat. You know, you can't, whatever it is, can't plant. But you didn't know that today was Shabbat. Okay, a little strange to think about, but I don't know. You got stuck in the desert, you know, stranded on, a, on an island. You lost track of the days. You have no idea. Okay, that's one. Option number two is you knew it was Shabbat, but you didn't know that Malacha was forbidden. Okay, so we're going to have something very similar here. Rav Asha brings a Mishnah that says, a Mishnah we're going to come to soon. I know that there's vows. The Aniodeh, but I don't know that Sheyesh Mefirin. I don't know though that I can actually nullify vows. In other words, my wife made a vow. I didn't know that I could actually nullify them. Okay. Um, next. So now what sorry, what happens? Yafel. If he didn't know he had the potential to be nullify the vows, on the day he finds out that he has potential, like he found out about the vow, let's say three months ago. But now he finds out he can actually nullify it 
That's when it kicks in Biyom Shama. And that's logical. But if he says, I knew I was allowed to nullify my wife's vows, that halacha I knew. But I didn't realize that what she said was actually considered a vow, right? She said some statement. I didn't realize that, that that's what a vow is. So Rabbi Meir, Omer, lo yafer, hachamim omrim yafer. Rabbi Meir on this one says, this can't be nullified. Okay, the rabbis would kind of understand it can be nullified because it's no different than the previous, right? It's like, now you figured it all out. But Rabbi Meir says no. To which the Gemara says, am I? Why does Rabbi Meir not allow this? Just like in Shotekam and Atlamekat, we give him a grace period. So likewise here, there should be a grace period. Tully found out that she knew that there was a nan there, we should allow it. In other words, again, it's like anytime, if we can already bend the rules for that, we should be able to bend the rules for this. Therefore, Tiyufta. So we're left again with a question. And with that, Hadron Alach Naram Rasa, we finish the chapter. And moving on to the next chapter, which is a continuation of these topics, but from a bit of a different perspective. Now we're going to talk about what vows is the husband allowed to nullify. If you remember, we've already talked about this, inoi nefesh and falim shebenola bena. Okay, things that are afflictions of her soul, like the food, not eating food, things like that. We're going to have to see what exactly comes in that category. And there's a debate about what comes into that category and things that affect their relationship. Benola bena. If you remember, we had a whole debate. We discussed, I'm not going to go through it again about whether this is true only for the husband and wife or also for the father. Is the father limited like the husband is in terms of which vows he can nullify or does the father have no limitation and only the husband has limitation? Okay. So now, these are the things that he can nullify. Okay, so that's what we said. What's some examples? If I will bathe or I will not bathe. If I will put makeup on or I won't put makeup on or I'll dress up or I won't dress up, okay, I'll adorn myself however exactly you define it. Rabbi Yossi says, these are not inoi nefesh. The Gemara is going to later ask on Dafpe Aleph or maybe Dafpe, I forget where it starts, but they're going to ask, are they Dvarim Shebein Olabena though? Okay, right? Whether she bathes or whether she makes herself look nice might affect their relationship. Okay, that's a separate question. But Rabbi Yossi doesn't think that these are afflicting your soul by not bathing or not making yourself look pretty. So what does Rabbi Yossi think are nidrei inoi nefesh? She says, the fruits of this world are forbidden to me. By the way, I didn't put this out, but the Gemara is going to get to it, which is, Im erchatzim lo erchatz, im et kashetim lo et kashet is not the language of a vow. Just so you know, right? Language of a vow is what we see now. Konam perot ha'olam alai. Right? Konam, something is forbidden to me. If, if I do, if I don't do, is not the language of a vow, the Gemara is going to struggle with this first case and say, what exactly is the language of the nedu that she's taking? That's going to be the beginning. We're going to start it today and continue tomorrow into understanding what that case is. So if you were wondering what that is, we're going to get to it. So now we're on Amud Bet. So Rabbi Yossi says, these are not Nidrei Yinu Nefesh. These are the things that are. She says, all the fruits of the world are forbidden to me. That's Yinu Nefesh. Then Rabbi Yossi says that, the husband can nullify. Perot Medina Zoalai, Yavila Mi Medina Acheret. If he says, if she says, okay, here Rabbi Yossi is now going into detail. If she says, though, I won't eat, let's say they live in Israel. I won't eat any fruits from Israel. Okay, so bring from outside of Israel. Okay, so it's to bring from a different place. If she just forbids this, that's not Inu Nefesh because there's a solution to that. Perot chem vanize alai, eno yachol afel. It's actually funny. I had an issue once with, a, with a, the owner of a fruit store and I refused to buy fruits in that store. Absolutely refuse. So that's like me saying, perot chem vanize alai. Okay, I will absolutely not buy in that fruit store. Eno yachol afel. So you can't ever nullify that vow. I'm sorry, right? He can't nullify that vow. Why? Because, right, happened in Renata, there's lots of fruit stores, right? You can go anywhere you want. You're, you're not really limited. But in Lohai Taparnasato Elami Menu, if that's the only fruit store in town, now what does it mean? It's not the only fruit store in town, but it's the only fruit store that he can buy from. Why would there be only one fruit store the husband can buy from? Well, it's the only fruit store that agrees to sell him on credit. That's what the commentators say. 
The only fruits that we'll give him on credit, and he can't afford to buy normally, he can only afford to buy on credit, then harese affair. Then even if there's other fruit stores, he can nullify that vow because he has no other way to buy her fruits. Tiver Rabbi Yossi. So that, according to Rabbi Yossi, is, you know, enough, but the others are not. So the Gemara now is going to ask the following question. We know that there's these two categories, Nidre Yinu Nefesh and Dvarim Shebeinol Lebeinah. But what did our Mishnah say? Our Mishnah said, the Nidarim that he can be made for are Dvarim Sheesh Beinu Nefesh. Notice what it didn't say. Dvarim Shebeinol Lebeinah. Things that have to do with their relationship. So Nidre Yinu Nefesh who do my fail? Sheem Bem Yinu Nefesh Eino my fail? Sounds like he can't be made for anything that's not Yinu Nefesh. Right? He can't nullify any of those vows unless it's Yinu Nefesh. Vatanya, but doesn't it say in a Braita? which is the pasuk at the end of that section we've seen already, between husband and wife, between father and daughter. From here they derive that the husband is allowed to nullify vows between him and her. If you remember, this was the pasuk where some people said, oh, there's the head case to the father, right? It must be true for the father as well, to which other people said, what are you talking about? It never says anywhere that we do this head case. And notice here, it says just the husband. So, that's where they say it's really just the husband, and that's hence the debate. Anyway, it's clear the husband can nullify more than just Inu Nefesh. So they say, Yes, it's true. He can nullify both of them. However, there's a difference between them, and that's why the mission only mentioned the Inu Nefesh ones, because it wanted to highlight that they're different. If it's Inu Nefesh, he can nullify it, and it's nullified forever. Aval aim behem inoi nefesh, but if there's no inoi nefesh, meaning it's been the bena, kedi ite tachote habiapara, while she's under his jurisdiction, he's married to her, he can be made fair. So he may, right, he nullifies it now, and it's nullified for the whole time of the marriage. Now I'm gonna, we're gonna read the Gemara now. I want you not to uh, etch this into your head because we're gonna change it. Okay, but right now, this is what they think. Michi la. But as soon as he divorces her, what happens? The nullification disappears. Okay, so she made a vow. Okay, like uh, I will not benefit from, you know, I will not benefit from my husband. I don't know, some sort of, in some particular way, let's say, in a way that it could work, because sometimes these vows don't work at all. Then while they're married, the neder applies. As soon as the marriage is over, the neder, I'm sorry, the my mistake. She took the vow. He nullified it. It's nullified. As soon as the marriage is over right now, they think, okay, we're going to change this. As soon as the marriage is over, the vow goes right back into place. So if it was, let's say, something that had to do with the two of them, now that they're divorced, he actually is forbidden, okay? What he permitted by nullifying it while they were married is now permitted. Okay, so that's what they think right now, to which the Gemara says, wait a minute. So first they say, but some people actually take out these lines, but they're going to say, this is really just to clarify, even though it's pretty clear anyway, and that's why some people take this line out. This is things that have to do with the two of them that are not in the category of Eno Nefesh. Okay? But, but, but just to be clear, if it's and it's also Eno Nefesh, Eno Nefesh is going to um, overpower, and then it's going to be nullified forever. Okay? But if it's benola bena and it's not affliction of her soul, then it will just be for the time of the marriage. And as soon as the divorce kicks in, right, he divorces her, the neder comes right back. It's very interesting to think about. There's this nullification temporarily because it all had to do with the two of them. As soon as the two of them are not together, it's gone. But like I said, we're going to clarify this because of our difficulty. Udvarim she'en bem inoi nefesh ki Really? If it doesn't have Inoi Nefesh, meaning it's between him and her, and you're going to say as soon as he divorces her, it goes right back, but that's not true because Hatanan, look at this Mishnah. It says in the Mishnah, Rabbi Yochanan ben Uri Omer Yafir. Okay, you're missing the beginning of the Mishnah, which is if a husband says to his wife, I'm sorry, a wife says to her husband, you will not benefit from my salary, right? Anything I create, whether it's her salary or she knits a, a blanket or whatever it might be, anything she creates, he can't benefit from. Now, you might remember, she's not allowed to do this. Why can't she do it? Because it's part of the relationship between a husband and wife. It's in the ketubah, right? Her say and basically go to her husband. So it's a meaningless vow, basically. However, says Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri, even though it's a meaningless vow, 
he should nullify it. Why should he nullify it? Shema yigar shena v'teasuralo. You have to, there's a whole bunch of things that come into play here that it's good review. There's another law that if he marries her, and let's say he remarries her, let's say he divorces and remarries, he can nullify vows from before, right? Previous vows from even when they were married the first time. So if she takes a vow while they're married and she says, you can't benefit from my Masi Adan. While they're married, it's an irrelevant vow. Comes Rabbi Yochanan Benuri and says, nullify it now though, why? Because after you get divorced, if you divorce her, you have to, he says, you have to look forward and worry about the future. If you divorce her and you want to remarry her, you won't be able to. Because when you divorce her, the neder will come into play if you don't nullify it. Okay, we'll get to what if you do nullify it. If you don't nullify it, the neder, while it's not valid while you're married, because that's part of your agreement, as soon as you divorce her, the neder will kick into play. It'll be relevant. Once the neder is relevant, now when you stand to want to remarry her, you can't because you can't marry someone who you're forbidden to benefit from. You can't go into the marriage knowing that. In other words, if they're in the marriage already and she says it, it's a meaningless statement. But if it's before the marriage, right, and he can't make fair could mean, he can't nullify things that happened before. So comes Rabbi Yochanan Benuri and says, nullify it now. Okay, here comes the key. Nullify it now. And what will happen? The nullification will remain even after the divorce, because otherwise, what's the point of nullifying it? So it's clear that Rabbi Yochanan Benuri thinks that the nullification will continue. And then you'll divorce her. The vow will still be nullified. So you can actually remarry her. So while you don't need to nullify it for today, you need to nullify it for the event that you divorce her. Because otherwise, you'll never be able to remarry her. And you want to not close off that option. Uh, let's just remind you of the rules of Mahzir Grusha too. First of all, this wouldn't apply to a Kohen because a Kohen can never re remarry his divorced wife. So a Kohen wouldn't have to do this according to Rabbi Yochanan Benuri. And who else? If, when else can't you remarry her? If she marries someone else in between, okay? So what Rabbi Yochanan Benuri is saying is, in case you want to remarry her in the event, right? She doesn't marry someone else and you want to be able to remarry her, nullify the vow today while you're still married, even though right now the, the vow is not going to apply so that you prevent some sort of right problem from happening. You won't be able to remarry her. So how can you say that Dvarim, right? That when it's come, when it's Dvarim Shebeno Lebena, how can you say that Dvarim Shebeno Lebena the hafara disappears, the nullification disappears after divorce. It doesn't. Here it clearly stays because that's Rabbi Yochanan Menuri's whole solution. Nullify it now so that it will be nullified even when you divorce her. So, so Alma, therefore, they say, based on what he said, when he divorces her and he had already nullified it from before, obviously the nullification still applies. To which the Gemara modifies what it said before. And that's why I said, don't, don't, you know, say, oh, that's definitely the case because we're going to change it. Amre, halen v'halen havya hafa. It is hafara, okay, meaning when you nullify the vow, even benola bena, okay, you know, nefesh for sure stays forever. Hafara also stay, um, benola bena, the nullification also works even after divorce. But here's the difference. El anidre inoi nefesh may fail ben la'atzmo ben la'acherim. Nidri inoi nefesh are nullified, whether for him or whether for others. This means, okay, um, even when she gets remarried to somebody else. Aval aim behem inoi nefesh, but if they're not inoi nefesh. So let's say she says, I won't eat any fruits. And he nullifies that vow. That vow is nullified forever. Okay, it never comes back into play. However, if it's Abraham Inoi Nefesh, meaning it's Beno Lebena, it's things between him and her specifically. He does it for his own sake, but not for others. What does that mean? So it means that if she forbids it for herself while she's married, okay, and it's something that has to do with him, as long as they can potentially have a relationship, that's Ben Latzmo. It's for his own sake. So that, that vow will be nullified until what point? Until such point as she gets remarried to someone else. If he divorces her and she remarries someone else, he can never remarry her. At that point, the vow, the nullification is gone and the neder kicks back in. So let's say she didn't allow him to benefit and let's say he's friends with her husband or something and he comes to the house and he wants to use, let's say we took the example of the blanket, he won't be able to use the blanket anymore because the neder kicked back in 
And if she said something about kol haolam, everybody can't benefit from me, then her new husband can't benefit from her. You follow? Like, then it will kick in to anybody. Okay? So it's all about the connection. This bein la'atzmo, bein la'achirim is really about the connection. Okay, I already recorded the Shabbos stuff, so I'm going to tell you in advance that I might have explained it a little bit differently, the bein la'atzmo, bein la'achirim. I only properly understood it now. So if you get confused then, I'm not going to re-record. So just go with this explanation. So bein la'atzmo, it's always the problem if you teach out of order. Um, but bein la'atzmo, bein la'achirim, just to really make it clear, it means as long as she can still remarry him, the neder is valid. Once that possibility is not a possibility anymore. So for example, if it were a Kohen, it would be a divorce. If it were a Yisrael, then only once she marries somebody else, then, then the nullification is dissolved. Okay, that's what it means. So then they say, katani, and this is how you should read it, our Mishnah. Because this was all to say, why did our Mishnah not mention ben ishli shto? These are complete nullifications, whether she's connected to him, whether she's not connected to him anymore, no matter what, it's complete. And what is that? That's what our mission talked about. And it wasn't talking about well, what the Bain Ishli show because that's a different type of nullification. It, it runs out at a certain point. Im Erchatz. Now we get to the difficult way trying to figure out exactly what the Simer Chatz is. I'll also tell you there's a whole bunch of different ways of understanding these difficulties because they're a little bit difficult, but we'll try to go with a simple way of explaining it. Hechi Kama. What exactly is our, what, what did she say in the vow? There's no such vow as if I shower, if I don't shower. Okay. da Amra. If maybe it's that she said, now Im is a condition. So we've seen this kind of Nidarim before, which is, um, if she says the fruits of the world will be, for, all of a sudden we're adding in something else, right? The fruits of the world will be forbidden to me if I bathe. Okay, I said shower. It's all the same, right? Bathe, shower. If I wash myself, the fruits of this world will be forbidden to me. Okay, now that seems reasonable. Then it's basically saying, right? That's Now this is, a, it's, it's sort of a combination. This is part of the problem. Because konam perot alai is, you know, in effort right? Because you're saying, I won't eat fruits. That's already in your effort. But you're conditioning it upon whether I will bathe. And whether I will bathe is that whole thing that was a debate between, well, that's how we understood, is bathing an issue or not? Now, right now, they're going to say, again, this is why it's confusing, because they're going to understand things a little bit differently as they suggest this. So they're going to suggest that there's a problem with the rabbi's way, the Tanakama's way of understanding, and there's a problem with Rabbi Yossi's way. So according to Tanakama, lama la hapara, lo tirchatz, and it's why does, he, right, the whole thing is he can be made fairer than Ed, or he can nullify it. Why does he need to nullify it? Why, basically what they're saying is, why is this Enoi Nefesh? This isn't really Enoi Nefesh, why? Loter Chatz, she just shouldn't bathe. Now, the, I, the concept here underlying this question, and this is why it's a little confusing, is that the bathing itself is clearly not Enoi Nefesh, even though that's what we thought it was. But right now, they're saying if the language of the vow is and it's that's the Enoi Nefesh and the bathing is not the Enoi Nefesh. So it's very simple. If it's not considered Enoi Nefesh to not ever bathe, okay, hard to believe, but let's say not ever bathe, then she just shouldn't bathe. And then the neder will never come into fruition because in other words, if she said, the fruits of the world will be, if she says the fruits of the world will be forbidden to me, for sure that's Enoi Nefesh. But if she says the fruits of the world are forbidden to me, if I do the following, so just don't do the following and the Nedar will never come into effect. That's a better solution than having to nullify it, right? This, we shouldn't allow nullification if there's a better way around it, which is just, she shouldn't bathe. Okay, again, hard to believe she should bathe. It's a little bit of a difficulty with this, but let's just go with that. It's a problem. Next. Uh, skip that word. Okay, to her. Next, ve'od. And furthermore, behalema Rabbi Yossi. Now we're going to have a problem with Rabbi Yossi. And now they're going to assume a little bit differently. Okay, this is, that one was presuming that according to the rabbis, okay, the, the way we're doing it is looking with each one with different glasses on. So according to the rabbis, we could say, why would you call this Enoi Nefesh? You could just prevent the Neder from ever taking effect. On the other hand, behalema Rabbi Yossi, ain't elu nitro Enoi Nefesh? 
if it's already including perot haolam alai, why would Rabbi Yossi think that's not inu nefesh? Dilma rachza. Now, this, this has the potential to become inu nefesh, right? Before, we were trying to say, if it's only potential, that's not inu nefesh. Now we're using the opposite logic. According to Rabbi Yossi, who says these are not inu nefesh, what do you mean? If you said perot haolam alai, it could become inu nefesh, right? Dilma rachza. Maybe she'll bathe. And then, itasru perot haolam alai. It has potential to be inu nefesh. So why would you say this isn't inu nefesh? What do you mean? This, and maybe the reason why they're asking this is because Rabbi Yossi being flippant and saying, this has nothing to do with Enoi Nefesh. What do you mean it has nothing to do with Enoi Nefesh? This is, could come to Enoi Nefesh. So basically, the, each question is assuming different assumptions, okay? But they're basically trying to say, that doesn't make sense if that's what the Mishnah is talking about. And I'm going to leave you in suspense today because we're going to have to wait till tomorrow's death to try to suggest some other possibilities until we really figure out what exactly is this Imer Chatz, Im Loar Chatz, Im Etkashit. Im Lo Etkashit. Not to mention, we have a problem. Even if you say it's, I won't bathe and I will bathe. What, what I will bathe? What's he knowing that about? I will bathe. That's also doesn't make any sense. They're giving the language and the opposite. It's very unclear, the mission. So wait till tomorrow. We'll try to figure it out then. Hopefully it will be clearer by tomorrow. Wishing everybody a great day.